Did you guys play this game when you were kids? Yeah, tic-tac-toe. I did with my brother. Uh, he is four years older than me. And this game was terribly frustrating. I kept losing and losing and I finally decided he's cheating somehow. <laughs> so my brother uh, felt sympathy for me at some point and he said, look girl, if you want to win, you got to think before you make your move. That changed everything because I think I imagined this was a game of luck and I was being unlucky all the time. So I did. I put myself in the shoes of my brother and before I made my next move, I said, if I put the cross over there, how will my brother react? What about if I put the cross here? What will be his response in that case? This sort of reasoning is called backward induction in game theory. Once I learned to consider what my opponent might do before I make my move, I did not lose the game anymore and we moved to games uh, with strategic interaction that were more complicated where I had to foresee my brother's many moves into the future, not only the next one. Today, I want to convince you that it's all a game from chess to politics. There is strategic interaction in many environments. Firms, when they compete over customers, are interacting strategically. What one firm does affects the other. When countries are trying to cooperate in environmental protection, they are interacting strategically. So all, all these environments are environments with strategic interaction. And game theory, understanding the logic of game theory, can help us analyze it and it can help us make better decisions. This is John Nash. He got the Nobel Prize in 94 in economics. He is not an economist. He is a mathematician. He got the Nobel Prize for giving us the backbone, the mathematical backbone of game theory. And you might have seen the movie. You did? Yeah, it's a good one. After John Nash, we made a lot of progress in maths and it gave us, all this math gave us very good toolbox, game theory toolbox to analyze strategic interaction in different areas, from economics to military strategy, from sociology to computer science, we use game theory in very many different areas. I will use my time by giving an example of how I put game theory into my research. No math, it's going to be just intuition. I just want you to have a flavor. What is it that the academics do with game theory? Before that, I want to talk about the Indian Cobra. The British rule hated Indian Cobra and they decided they're going to get rid of it. So they announced a price policy. They said, you bring me a dead Cobra, I'll pay you so much money. And they saw Cobras coming in and they said, wow, aren't we really successful in our policy? What a good idea. But really, what happened, you know? Yes, exactly. So the Indians started having cobra farms. This is an example of failure in backward induction. It caused unintended consequences. And if we know about game theory, we will first think, well, that sounds like a good idea, but is it? How will people respond to it? Here's an example from my research. I worked on political campaign spending limits. How much a politician spends affects the politician's votes, but it also affects the other politician's votes. So there is strategic interaction. In Ireland, we have spending limits, but Ireland is not the only country. It's very widely used in the world. And what it does is, even as a politician, if you have the war chest, you're not allowed to spend more than a certain amount, the limit, on your political campaign. You might think that elections are not really all that fair. Because think of an incumbent. An incumbent is a politician who is already sitting in the seat, in the political seat. This incumbent, when he reruns for office, has a head start advantage because his name is already known. So Daniel, if you're running, you have to establish your name first. And if I'm the incumbent, I'm already 
ahead of you. Furthermore, the incumbent is sitting in the political office, so the incumbent is able to give political favors to donors, to contributors. That makes it easy for them to do fundraising for the campaign spending in the future. So proponents of spending limits say that it's the corner store of the good functioning democracy because spending limits can put candidates with lesser means on an equal footing. And this is what I want to know. Is it true? <laughs> Think of a playing field. And the playing field is initially not level. Now, if the spending limit makes the playing field level, it's possible that the disadvantaged candidate starts running faster because now they have a hope of winning the competition. But that will induce the advantaged candidate to put more effort. And that will have a reaction on the disadvantaged candidate. So obviously, the limit changes the nature of the intensity of the competition. And game theory gives us the tool to analyze the exact nature and how, where we would find ourselves eventually in equilibrium. The first item to notice to understand the intuition of the setup is that to overcome the head start of the incumbent, the challenger has to spend more than the incumbent. And, but the spending limit makes it harder for the challenger to overcome the incumbent's head start. So in fact, we show that spending limits can actually benefit the incumbent with the head start advantage, which is the opposite effect of the stated goal, the COBRA effect. So fair competition with the spending limits, not necessarily. And now you might say, look, actually we could have guessed this, because after all, it is the incumbents, the guys sitting in office, who are the legislators. They decide on the existence of a spending limit and how much the limit should be. They're not going to legislate something that's going to disadvantage them. If you want to know more about game theory, that gives the intuition and covers about 10 Nobel Prize winners in game theory uh, with no math at all, um, I recommend, <laughs> because I wrote it after all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you.